This video is brought to you by Midway USA. Support the channel by choosing Midway for your shooting and outdoor supplies. Impact! Neutralize! 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 I see him! I heard it. Yeah, it might have been. I. He's in shadow, so it's a. I heard it. Yeah. Yep, that one for sure. Okay. I mean, I heard that shot. I think and I... it was, dude. I think it was. I just couldn't. I couldn't be sure about it. Ninety-two seconds on the clock with that last shot. Okay. Okay, so another Global War on Terror classic that we uh, decided to start this uh, series off on. One of my uh, first rifles that I put together when I was serious about precision rifle shooting and um, lots to talk about. We'll see you guys at the debrief. Well, hello there. You must have caught us at the Battalion Field Headquarters as we were about to break for lunch. Now we're trying to not have the MREs. I hear the boys in the field are quite fond of them. I hope you're enjoying the show thus far. Shows like this, they're brought to you by Slate Black Industries. And more importantly, we have the support from the patrons of Patreon and Utreon. Now that's true. This group of men and women, they support us intellectually, financially, but most importantly, emotionally. So today, I'd like to invite you, come, join us, become one of us. Together, we could plan to conquer the world of firearms technology. But if you cannot, that's all right. We completely understand. We'd be just as happy to hear from you in the comments section below. Well, without further ado, we'll leave you back to it. Welcome back into the debrief. That was the M21 on Speedway. And Henry, I mean, that was a gas run. You, you shot that with only one miss on the bonus target. And unfortunately, that one miss sent you to bolt lock. You had to do a reload. You gave away that you're actually a Soviet spy in doing ah. all of this. <laughs> oh man, it, just an absolute catastrophe. Oh, imagine that, right? You know, in in the midst of combat, being a being outed as a Soviet spy with the under with the underslung reload that you couldn't reach.
<laughs> the bolt isn't where it's meant to be. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this is the first run. This is the first practical accuracy or a speedway run that we've ever done um, yeah. as we kind of sort of validate the course uh, going out, right? Mm. And that's also, right. And it, it's, that's interesting. I want people to realize this. So, obviously, it's not in sequence, right? We, we've run a number of Speedway episodes, but the M21 was actually the first ever recorded episode on Speedway. Yeah. So, Henry's still learning the course to a degree in this particular run. And I, uh, I did not shoot the wrong target, at the very least. For, that's for true. This. That's true. <laughs> well, look, I mean, Henry, we so often... On this show, you know, we, we talk about a number of platforms, and one of those platforms, obviously, is the M14 and is the potential accuracy of that rifle. Obviously, this run demonstrates that along with our, our practical accuracy episode, specifically the redemption episode, which we've done more recently, that this is absolutely a, a capable platform. Yeah, well, yes. Um it... It's a capable platform with caveat, Josh. You can't just throw things like that out there. <laughs> if you were to take a bone stock M14 and just throw a scope on it, it would not be able to perform to this extent. What? No. I know. Absolutely crazy, right? Oh, no. yes, it could, Henry. It could. The, <laughs> I the want amount, it to be true. The amount of tribulation that has gone through in generating an actual M21, the amount of people that I've had to meet in order to meet the right person to do this. And uh, this is, it was not just one gunsmith that this went to. It went to two separate ones, which the first one was supposed to be the end all M14 gunsmith. And he messed it up. It had to go to my friend's dad, who was an AMU, uh, I think it was one of their senior gunsmiths, that had been just doing the M21 program for the AMU during that period and a President's 100 for his own sake because it, there's a difference between a gunsmith who could only gunsmith and a gunsmith who could is also a competitor. There is a huge difference between that because then you have someone who actually understands what what you're looking for in the long term. Henry, that's why that's why I am such a rare and incredible uh, individual because I am both a competitor and a gunsmith on ARs. I gunsmith my ARs all you, the you, time. You gumsmith your ARs <laughs> on your kitchen table, Josh. Let's not get that, let's not get that twisted. <laughs> that said Dremels Dremels are with a, gunsmith tools. with a Z Dremels <laughs> that said <laughs> veering back to the M21 Josh stop it uh, it was uh, I'm in a certain sense I'm glad we started with a 308 a low recoiling 308 that has a an MOA or sub MOA capability on semi-automatic because um that so so there's a lot of give and take that that we've all discovered with the speedway experiment so far there are a lot of strengths to the 556 cartridge especially you see that at the close range targets look at the scar the block to any of those that we've shot on speedway lightning fast up close Shoot the Mark 12s, dude. I mean, just absolutely yeah. shred fest out from like zero to 300. I mean, yeah. And and typically you see the 308s that, you know, I'll have to take a little bit more time on recovery. I try to give it just a, an extra nanosecond just to make sure that I have the hold correct before I drop it on the target with 308s because mm. your recover time is going to be longer than a 5.56. Uh, you're going to be off glass for just a little bit longer than a 5.56. And all of that stuff compounds when you're talking about shooting a heavy recoil. Some of the other rifles, there's one particular I'm thinking about that's yeah. even heavier on the recoil. And if you just start squeezing, you just take even more time that's compounded on on the recovery. Um, mm -hmm. So taking just that extra nanosecond to make sure that you're dropping the round correctly on target knowing that you have less of a wind deflection pushing out on long range, the 308 rifles, and the M21 is a good example of this, a good accurate 
reliable semi-automatic 308 is in the long run going to give you a more consistent performance i.e you don't stack all of your stats on the short range targets and you kind of spread right. them out a little bit you know you have the wind you have an advantage when you're playing with wind in the long and longer ranges as well and i think that's something that we saw with the m21 here and one other thing that you don't typically think about are how does it miss the m21 with a one miss you saw here was extremely uh prevalent you could see it you can see exactly where it missed the shooter saw it i was on glass when i saw it splash on the right side of the target i immediately corrected it and and sank a um uh, sank a hit after of course the soviets fumble on the uh, reload uh and that's actually an advantage when you're shooting a, a 308 that it creates bigger splashes you could see where you're missing so you could adjust to it a lot easier it's a really really good point that is so often overlooked right yeah i mean yeah. I, that's something we never really talk about but mm -hmm. it's absolutely true right it's absolutely true now, one of the things you also were talking about is like it's a well gassed system as well. So it's not like recoiling, it's not recoiling such that it really is moving you off the target and off glass significantly. How does it stack up against, let's say, I don't know, the SCAR 17? The SCAR Heavy is also one that we've done on the show at this point. Uh, we've done a speedway on it. It was a that was a challenging one, I think, for a number of reasons. The weather, the people, there were people on range with us that were right next to us that were making it harder to film a little bit. Not to make excuses for the run, but there were some other factors going on outside of the shooting there that that made it a little bit more difficult. But how would you say that this gas is sort of like compared to like a Scar Sevy? Uh, had a wow. Scar Sevy, yes, the Scar Sevy. Let's talk. Let's call it that. Uh, Scar Seventeen Heavy. <laughs> um how, how would you say gas is compared to the scar 17 it's huh the m21 here if we were to put it onto ar terms feels like a gas tuned um ar actually and the scar heavy you could feel that pop a little more it's not a heavy recoil the scar heavy is not a heavy yeah. recoiling rifle especially when you compare it to the ak4d um, the AK-40E is also not a heavy recoiling rifle. It's just the recoil is also is is just it lasts longer. I don't know how to say it, but the roller delayed blowback rifles they just the recoil it lasts longer, like a 45 um, for pistols. The M21 is both lighter and it's a shorter recoil, and it also doesn't run a muzzle brake, so you don't get a concussive force from the front of it. Uh, so as far as a rifle that kind of keeps you on glass on target and on your concentration on this particular m21 actually does a pretty good job at doing that the scar however i mean is easier to suppress that is something that that's just useful for for modern day use you know if you're using a uh if you're using a semi-automatic sniper system you want a system that is suppressible you want to be able to hang things off of but again you know if we're talking about just pure rifle the m21 is not from the same era that we're talking about well right they overlap but it's not from the same era the m21 was taking an m14 and doing a tremendous amount of work to it in order for it to fit a mold uh, and then every two or four thousand rounds, I'm supposed to send it in to get it rebedded, which I don't think I'll ever get to uh, get it rebedded. So it's on a ticking, it's on a ticking time um, into its final state. But as far as it is right now, it's in its peak. It's in its peak yeah. form right now. Yeah. Um, the recoil, I think, in the in a very vacuum sense, is actually very pleasurable to shoot for even like novice shooters, because mm -hmm. then in the long run you're also encapsulating the advantages of running a 175 grain Sierra Match King 308 cartridge behind it, and not a 77 grain or even more difficult, a 55 grain cartridge uh, on a course like this at the long distance targets. You know, Henry, that's an interesting point because one of the things that you you, know, you brought up is how this particular rifle, the 308 specifically, the one the 175s, they they allow you to that combination of the system allows you to sort of uh, spread 
the capability of the platform a little bit more smoothly over the the totality of the course without front loading it like the 556 i think that was a a really well put statement and also the caveat to that or, or the asterisk to that is that that's also true as you extend further right our course stops at a certain distance based off of what is reasonable and plausible for us on the range we have but there is also the reality that if you extended the course to a thousand for example those the prevalence of what you're describing is even more true right as the 556 drops off obviously that 175 continues to be effective out to 800 plus a thousand and potentially you know like 1100 even though then you're really starting to stretch but we've seen you make those hits before mm -hmm. uh, so i think that those are obviously like very relevant within the context of this conversation talk us through a little bit here on the the 175 specifically and how they stack up to something like just for example the 77s on 556 guns so you see the 77s really um the 77s, obviously, they, they do extend the range of the 5.56. Uh, but it's at the end of the day, it's still a much lighter cartridge with uh, less amount of um, powder uh, propellant that pushes the, the cartridge through. Uh, it is going at a faster speed, but then at the same time, it also slows down faster than the um, 7.62.51 just for the fact that it doesn't have the mass backing it on the yeah. on the um, on the uh, momentum that it pushes out, the concept of overmatching. If you're talking about a 600 or 700 meter target, both cartridges will hit that target. That is not a question about it. But why, in some instances, would you still want to prefer to to pack a 308 or have someone on your unit run the 308? Um, penetration is a thing. People hide behind cover. Uh, it is you don't have a single type of cover out there, and so while we're shooting steel targets right now, sometimes if the target were behind, let's say like a single layer, uh, a single brick layer wall, your seven six two is probably going to perform far superior to your seventy um, sevens. Another thing is wind deflection. You're going to receive less wind deflection on the long term, on the longer range targets, and so a lot of that type of stuff kind of takes away some of the brain power from the shooter and and be able to to focus on the raw terminal performance on of the seven six two five one. I don't know. Is that sort of what you were looking for? Yeah, Henry. I think that 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 sort of uh, that covers us through the ammunition. I mean, the one seventy five in my mind is for the 308 is what the 77 is for the 556 in terms of you know our our at least what we've done with them on range it's our preferred cartridge when we're pushing out uh, at distance with the 308 now there's there's a couple things i want to talk about here we we joked earlier about your reload and how it uh <laughs> how it gave away that we had been shooting a lot of ak's talk us through what happened yeah, I mean, I, I, first of all, I, I expected that round to be a hit, so I did not, I approached it very confidently, but as soon as I saw that it was not a hit, and I felt that the bolt had locked back, and I felt the bolt locked back too, so that's why you saw me dump the, dump the mag immediately, and slam a new mag in. Like you said, yeah, that part is a very intuitive AK rock lock paddle magazine type of thing maybe be again because we were shooting a lot of AKs the next thing I did after I locked the magazine in was trp, stick my arm underneath and uh, that's a trainable thing uh, but at the same time I was not shooting the M14 as much as I have and so typically when you lock the magazine in on the M14 the charging handle is actually very close to your pointer finger or your trigger finger you just roll it over and pull the charging handle and, and run it forward. It's a very fast and intuitive motion. I didn't do that, and in, even worse, when I stuck my when I did the AK reach around, I was looking for the charging handle being all the way up front. I don't know if you noticed that. I, I was yeah, trying. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. was trying to like find the charging handle up front, like an AK. <laughs> I couldn't find it. I kept on pulling it backwards, and finally, I found it all the way in the at the back. And in my mind, I was like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe, I can't believe in my mind I was shooting this like an AK." Um, but 
that's I, I want to just hit on this though. Like it, the the point here is how important training remains. He, th- that what Henry did, it was that is where his brain went for reload because we had spent at that time we had spent like the last two to three months training up with the Kalashnikov platform and that manual of arms. It's not something that you're intuitively like training on. If you're shooting mostly ARs, like that's not the type of reload that you do, but once you've done it and you sort of have ingrained that into your mind, that's how you default. You literally are watching how the human brain defaulted back to what Henry had been training. And that is, exceptionally interesting for me from a performance perspective to see where that default goes and why it goes to a certain place at certain points in time. Very interesting. So Henry, one other thing before well, we wrap was, this up. I was going to add up, to that though. I was going to add to that though. It doesn't help that I was wearing a damn Gorka suit when, <laughs> when I was doing the, the AK reload on the, uh, on the Western capitalist rifle. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I was even wearing like a Russian a Russian uniform doing that stuff. Th- this but, is true. Maybe that's why you defaulted. It, no, it was just, no. it was the Gorka doing it. Yeah, it was, it was the, the Gorka doing it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, but, but, but before we wrap this episode, one of the things I want to talk about here is where does the M14 stroke, where's this M21, if we want to call it, you know, the conversion to the M21, where does it sit? within the history of the American sniper rifle? Where does it sit in terms of the SAS? How does it fit in historically? Yeah, so historically, America has always been taking service rifles and turning them into sniper rifles. You see this with the O3A4. Uh, You see this with the M1C, M1D. And of course, it logically would make sense to take the next um, the next rifle that America adopted and try to turn it into a sniper rifle. Especially when you consider that these things only serve 10 years as a main rifle. We made so many of them and they are just stacked in the armories. And we did not at that point. Uh, we had issues initially with the reliability and the longevity of the M14s um, uh, being turned into XM21s. Uh, and so snipers in the 80s and the 90s actually went towards the M21 or the M24 system, uh, the Remington, the bolt action uh, system. And the reason people, people have this, uh, back when I put this together, there was this misnomer that, um, you know, America was at war. So... We needed to go dust off these M14s that were in the armory and just put a scope on it and send it to the front. That was not necessarily what we did. We had to use um, some some companies use their OCO funds um, to have gunsmiths work on it. And there were a lot of contractors who would work on it. I think Smith Enterprise was one of the big ones that worked on a lot of M21 conversions. They have their Crazy Horse conversion too. Uh, And so the idea for the M21s is kind of like the AK-4D process because you had all these things in inventory. It wasn't like you were buying a new serialized item and bringing it into the inventory. You were able to upgrade the existing package into something that is uh, usable, which is also, you know, the you look at it during the adoption of the M21 and then a lot of these Macmillan stocked M21 upgrades that you saw during the global war on terror, uh, those, uh, those existed. And then you have uh, the next generation would be the Mark 14, the EBR. Uh, which is a largely bolt-on solution rather than a glass bed solution for the the M14 upgrade to a marksman's rifle. Mm -hmm. But that really is a dead end because even when you came up with the EBR, the Sage chassis system, it was so difficult to maintain those things to shoot well. Right, I have it in a civilian environment. I am not lugging it around on hills in Afghanistan. Uh, 
and I, I have the luxury of not being in, you know, deep doo-doo if I dropped it off of a four foot cliff uh, and needing it to be, you know, rebedded back stateside. And meanwhile, I'm right. overseas and, you know, now the sniper section's out of rifle. Um, I'm not in that situation. And on top of that, the the uh the way you, we use the smith enterprise uh, rail system or any of the 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 optic rail systems on the back it has a um if you didn't gas it correctly and you didn't use a correct magazine it had a tendency of jamming uh car uh, spent casings like where the 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 op rod yeah, was the gap right mm-hmm. And w- when it went forward that would that created a for a front section to where it could just bind a casing onto it uh, so the system was finicky at best um, if you did a mass upgrade to m14 rifles and so really the best the next best solution was to adopt the um the m110 the the cac system and right. i think uh there were a few contenders to that actually there was a dsa submitted a uh, an accurized foul to compete with that platform Whoa. too. Yeah, I know, I know. But really, in my mind, if you're talking about Cold War battle rifles, the the ones that really were the most modular and upgradable, it's really the G3. The the FAL doesn't have that accuracy because of the tilt bolt system. It's very difficult to accurize that type of system. Um, the M14 is still difficult to accurize a system, um, and, but at the same time, it's doable. Uh, but it, it turns out to be very finicky because of how you have to bed the stock. And so, with all of those aspects built into it, it doesn't make sense to continually upgrade this 1960s rifle into something um, if you could just buy something new and replace all of it. And the M110 system, despite having some of its own finickiness, is largely a successful replacement, uh, mm-hmm. followed by the M110A1, but that's a different story. Uh, but still, the M21, I think, has a silhouette that, if you see it from far away, it's unmistakable. It's not from this century. The way it looks, just the rotating bolt on top that traces its lineage back to the Garand, the op rod exposed onto the side. It's an attractive system that has a lot of histo- uh, historical references in it. But despite how well it can do in a vacuum state, like testings that we saw today, I still would be very hesitant in saying that this should be a mass issuance item because of how finicky it could be and because of how relatively fragile it is compared to some of the other systems like the M110 or M110A1 or even the AK4D. So, I mean, what do you think? Like, you've worked around this thing with me for a while. What do you think about it? I share the sentiment. You summarized it perfectly with that last statement. Like, in terms of the finickiness, it requires, a white glove is the wrong word, but it requires somebody who is very in tune with the system to be paying attention to it all the time to ensure that it functions correctly. Mm -hmm. That's that's where I would end on it. And I have rifles like that too. Some rifles, they just require, like, you to know because it's your gun you know how it performs or what it believe you know how what it likes what it doesn't like under certain circumstances so on and so forth like i think that's this is one of those rifles yeah it's uh it's one of those things like i think to history nerds it really kind of tickles the that side that part of our minds because it's it's kind of like a steampunk project it's like these upgraded ak's right like you can't mass manufacture those things. The the AKs mm-hmm. you can't mass upgrade the AK seventy fours to with Zeneco stuff. You know, needing someone to hammer that crap in and stuff like that easily. But even that is easier than this to upgrade, and requires a lot less specialized tools to to upgrade it. You know, so yep. 
Yeah, I mean, what can I say? It's one of those things. It's like, uh, why does a Walther PPK not serve as Germany's main sidearm, despite it being very iconic and beautiful for its time? It's iconic and Stop beautiful, it. but it has Stop issues. It. Stop referencing that gun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're still with us, do all of those great YouTube things if you'd be so kind. Like, comment, subscribe. Make sure the notification bell is turned on. Follow us over at 9H Podcasts. We're also on Rumble. And if you're so inclined, Utreon and Patreon will give you access to our private Discord server. We hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And until next time, we'll see you on the range. Seven one six is Bill Knight six four Vic eight packs red con one green to green top copy over. Bill Knight six this is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one pack green green over. Seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight two one big two two packs red con one over.